It is my pleasure to uh, introduce Ken Light. Uh, Ken is an American social documentary photographer. He was born in the Bronx and grew up in the 60s and got his start covering and documenting the events of the times, especially the resistance and protest movement against the war in Vietnam and Indochina. And early in his career, his work was distributed by Liberation News Service, and that sounds very interesting, to, to many of the underground and alternative newspapers that were flourishing at the time, such as LA Free Press, the Berkeley Barb, and the East Village Other. And Ken has spent over 50 years covering many social issues and has published a number of books on a variety of topics. And among them is uh, Delta Time. Um, and this book looks at uh, rural black poverty, cotton, and the Southern landscape. And it featured an essay uh, by Bob Moses, the legendary civil rights organizer who actually just passed away a few days ago. Uh, Texas Death Row, uh, published in 1997, is a look at the life of the condemned waiting to be executed in America's largest and most active death row. Valley of Shadows and Dreams documents life in California's Central Valley. Coal Hollow photographs and oral history, uh, photographs and oral histories of coal miners in West Virginia. And Ken's most recent book, Course of Empire, in which he spent the last 10 years photographing the American social landscape. And Ken will show and uh, pictures and tell us a little more about that. Ken's work has been exhibited over 225 times here and internationally. And he's received numerous awards and grants, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, two National Endowment for the Arts Photographers Fellowships, also the Dorothea Lang Fellowship and a fellowship from the Erna and Victor Hasselblad Foundation, the American Film Institute, and many more, as well as the Media Alliance Meritorious Achievement Award in Photography and the Thomas More Stork International Journalism Award. Ken is also a professor of photojournalism and curator at the Center for Photography at the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California, Berkeley and was the 2012 Laventhal Visiting Professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Ken's also taught workshops at many school and photo festivals around the world and is the founder of the Mother Jones International Fund for uh, Documentary Photography, as well as a founder of PhotoVision, a nonprofit documentary photo organization based in the San Francisco area. Wow. Uh, Welcome, Ken. I'll let you take it. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for joining. Um, I have a lot of pictures to show. I was trying to figure out what to show, and I'm just going to dive in and kind of, you know, 50 years of being a photographer. It's actually over 50 years now, but I say 50 years. It sounds like a good number. Um, lots of different projects. Um, so let me share the screen. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about my traveling across America, photographing the, the social landscape. And basically, I am um, a photographer who has felt deeply that um, there's so much to see in this country, and there's so many stories to tell. And so often, uh, we as Americans point our fingers at everyone else and tell people you need to do this and you need to do that. And we don't look at our own backyard and our own backyard is pretty dirty uh, with lots of issues and lots of problems. And I've kind of more or less dedicated um, my career to um, looking at those issues. Um, whoops. So I'm gonna start just by telling you my motivation, where I came from. Uh, this is a picture of me in 1958. Um, I was born in the Bronx, but my parents, uh, when I was three years old, moved out to a town called East Meadow, which was next to Levittown. Levittown was the first uh, suburban community built after World War II. When the soldiers came back from the war, uh, there were potato fields on Long Island, and they turned these into suburban homes. Um, it was kind of an idyllic life, uh, but, but underneath there was a lot of shadows. Um, I played uh, doing photography when I was young. My dad was an amateur photographer. This is actually the type of camera I use, which is really fascinating. It's a 120 film camera, which is what I shoot with now. Not this camera, but uh, 120 film, medium, medium format. 
but I grew up in an age when the world was kind of um, unconscious. Um, for example, I remember as a young kid, uh, the DDT trucks would come through our neighborhood spraying what we called fog. No one knew it was DDT. We just knew it as the fog machine. Um, and we would run, not me, but my friends would run through the spray uh, as it went through our backyard. Uh, and these photographs are not taken by me. They're taken by other pho photographers like this is Danny Lyon, a uh, photograph of the civil rights movement. So as, as a young kid growing up in this era in the 50s uh, and early 60s, uh, I was conscious of the civil rights movement, although I was not involved in it. Um, of course, we had uh, the horror of uh, nuclear annihilation. Um, and as a very young kid in 1962, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this is actually a page from the diary I kept during the Cuban mi Missile Crisis when we all thought we were gonna be blown up and, and die. We had then the assassination of President Kennedy. This is a photograph by Richard Avedon. Um, this is a Gordon Parks photograph. We had the assassination of, of Malcolm X, the assassination of Dr. King. We had the Vietnam War. Of course, this is Eddie Adams' famous photograph uh, during the Tet Offensive. And then in 1969, I was 18 years old, um, graduating from high school, getting ready to go off to college. And we had Woodstock, and we had the, no, I did not take this picture, uh, the planting of the flag on, on the moon. We had the, the moon landing. Um, so I headed off to college. Um, I eventually got uh, this film camera, um, Nikon F, um, loaded my own 35 millimeter film, uh, handheld light meter, learned how to work in the darkroom. And I began to photograph the world around me. Uh, I was 18 years old. Um, I wouldn't say I had any idea of what I was doing in terms of how to tell a story or a storyline or that someday the pictures I would make might be in a book. Um, I just was really driven by the things around me. Um, and I like to say I was just very curious. Uh, and as I said uh, earlier, um, I was... Um, interested in politics and concerned about politics. Um, and so I just photographed the, the things that I saw. Um, free concerts. Um, in 69, um, I was active politically. So I would say I was not yet uh, self-identified as a photographer, although I made photographs. Um, I was a political organizer at, on, on the campus. Um, and we organized um, in 1969 um, to protest the Vietnam War in Washington, DC. And this is one of my favorite political buttons from that era. This is a button designed by Alexander Calder, Calder uh, supporting the new mobilization against the war in Vietnam in 1969. Um, I began to become more deeply connected to doing photography. Um, and it was a mix between a being going to school, being a political organizer on campus and photographing the things around me. And then these are some of the photographs made in 1969 of the protests against the war in Vietnam. Um, in 1970, in the spring of 1970, um, the, the war began to um, increase, uh, kind of explode. And the president then, President Nixon, decided with Henry Kissinger, who was Secretary of State, that uh, they would secretly bomb Cambodia. Um, and it was a secret for about three days. And then it was revealed by the media that the US government was heavily bombing, carpet bombing Cambodia, which had been a neutral country. And the campuses all over America exploded with protests. Um, I hitchhiked. I was going to school in Athens, Ohio. I hitchhiked up to Columbus. Um, and began to photograph the protests at Ohio State University, uh, which were massive. And the governor at that time, Republican Governor Rhodes, called out the National Guard to put down the student protests. Uh, five days later, um, similar protests had broken out at Kent State University, um, and the same National Guard soldiers went up to Kent. And as we know, four students on May 4th, 1970 were killed during the protests. 
uh, by the National Guard. Um, it was really at this point that I kind of became a photographer. Um, I was actually, uh, shortly after this photograph was made, um, and this was shot with a Pentax 35 millimeter camera with a 50 millimeter lens um, and a handheld light meter. Um, shortly after I made this photograph, I was arrested by the highway patrol and charged with inciting to riot. I had a press pass on my jacket, which they ripped off and ripped it up into little pieces of paper, threw it up in the air like confetti and said, you're not a journalist anymore. Uh, I was taken to, to, prison, to jail. Uh, when I got out, um, uh, fortunately, there was a paper bag with my name on it, which had my camera and my film. And I went back to uh, Athens, developed the film, um, and sent the photographs to New York to Liberation News Service, uh, which Peter has described as kind of the associated press of underground uh, publications. The photographs uh, that I made, and here's, here's a picture of me uh, in 1970. The photographs I made then appeared on the, the packet that was mailed out every week to underground newspapers. And at that time, there were about 650 underground newspapers. And my photographs appeared literally all over the world. Um, and you know, um, I'm 19 years old. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite an experience then to see your pictures published uh, in all different types of, of publications. Um, and these are just a few examples of how the photographs I made uh, that particular day uh, were, were published. Um, I also discovered later, because of my uh, political activity and my work in the underground newspapers uh, and my photography, that the FBI began to have, make a file about me um, and about the work that I was doing. This is one of the, one of the pages uh, from my FBI file, which I got many, many years later. So I continued photographing um, the world around me. Um, I went to Nixon rallies. Um, this is the May Day demonstration in Washington, DC in 1971. This is Bobby Seale, uh, founder of the Black Panther Party at a political rally and his bodyguard. Um, I traveled with President Nixon when he came out to Ohio when he was uh, running for his second term. This is John Lennon and Yoko Ono, at, also at a political rally in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, this is me in 1972 uh, at, when I had hair. Peter, remember that? Um, while I was photographing the Republican convention in Miami where Nixon received um, this, the second nomination uh, of the Republican party. This is the inauguration. One of the things that's really interesting about this era, and it's, and it's fascinating, uh, the book that I'm gonna show you uh, in a little bit as I go through all these pictures, of course of the empire, brought me back to Washington, photographing in the Capitol, going, going to the White House and photographing at the White House. Um, the access that we had during this era in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s for photographers was so, was so more open um, than it is now where it's so much more controlled uh, and where you can't really get that close. And so this, this is photograph of Nixon's inauguration party uh, was taken with a 28 millimeter lens. So I'm just really right there, right in the audience. Um, during this era, I photographed many different places. This is high school in, in the Bronx. Um, these are the POWs returning as the war ends and winds down. This is going west. Um, in 1973, I moved to California from Ohio. This is a photograph taken in West Oakland. And then in 1974, Nixon resigns because of Watergate. Um, and that kind of ends this project. Um, and this ended up being a book called What's Going On of my early photographs uh, from 1969 to 1974, which was published about uh, five, five years ago. Um, and so I traveled with the negatives uh, over many years. I kind of went back and edited. And of course, um, as you stand back from work that you did decades ago, the meanings of photographs and the history really changes 
and you kind of look at your work and it has, you know, pictures in this era that might have not seemed that interesting, all of a sudden become much, much more interesting uh, because of the times. Um, and this is the last picture of uh, in, in that particular book. I then um, started freelancing in the Bay Area as a photographer and ended up uh, working at UC Berkeley with a group called the Labor Occupational Health Program. And it was a group of doctors and lawyers and labor organizers and me as a media person doing movies, uh, documentary films about work and doing slideshows. We called them multimedia slideshows where you use multiple projectors showing slides and um, photographing work. Um, and, I, and again, um, the access, the ability to get into factories and workplaces was very different than it is now. Um, and so I went into uh, a lot of workplaces and I did a whole series of industrial photographs. Um, while I was there um, working at the, the occupational health program, um, a lot of different publications would come over my desk and I began to see photographs of young children working in agricultural fields. And this would have been uh, about 1976, 1977. And I was really surprised uh, that young children were working in agricultural fields in the United States. I thought that had kind of ended, you know, with Lewis Hine, but I discovered that in fact, um, child labor in agricultural fields was something that was not banned. Um, and so as part of my job, um, I took off to Texas and I began to photograph agricultural workers in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and I realized pretty quickly that if I did a project uh, simply in, um, in Texas, and this is one of the early photographs in the Rio Grande Valley, um, that people would say, oh, this is just in Texas. And so I realized a visual strategy needed to be that I needed to travel all over the US and I needed to document the conditions. I also had kind of a pivotal change in my photography. Um, and when I, when I moved to California in 73, I early on had a photograph, I had a show of my early work that you just saw um, in Palo Alto. Um, and it was reviewed in a publication called Art Week, which at that time was kind of the main publication for art, photography, sculpture, paintings, uh, all the visual arts very important in California, weekly publication. Um, and a review came out of my work in the show. And um, the person who wrote this review said, there's a group of young photographers who are, uh, who are working in Berkeley and you should meet them. Um, and so I was at that point 21. Um, I went to Berkeley. I met these young photographers. They included Richard Mizrock and um, Steve Fitch and Roger Minnick, and these were all photographers who were working uh, in the studio, which was a student run uh, center at UC Berkeley, um, semi affiliated with the university, but somewhat independent. They were all working with Hasselblads. They were all shooting medium format. And here I was kind of a 35 millimeter photographer doing reportage, but I was really fascinated with the size of the negative, uh, the ability to make big prints. We all still were working in the darkroom. And so um, I decided with this project to move from 35 millimeter to medium format, which I've continued to do for pretty much uh, all my career from this po point on. And so um, I photographed with a Hasselblad, sometimes with a tripod. Um, I traveled all over the United States photographing agricultural workers. Uh, I received my first National Endowment for the Arts Photographers Fellowship that allowed me to travel widely in the country. And as you saw, I did that book called um, With These Hands with an introduction by Cesar Chavez, who at that time was still alive. Um, as I photographed, I began to see more and more um, undocumented workers in the fields. Um, and I was wondering what, where they were coming from and what this was about. And I decided that I should go to the border as part of my work in this book. Uh, here's a photograph of me photographing with the Border Patrol. I traveled extensively with the Border Patrol. Um, and uh, as I began to publish that first book, which would be the first uh, monograph of my own work, I realized that there was a whole new story 
um, unfolding in front of me. And that became this book that I did with Aperture called To the Promised Land. Um, and I had first started photographing on the border. Um, and then I realized as curators saw my work and other people looked at my work, they really didn't kind of get the story. So I decided I need to go into Mexico and photograph in Mexico um, to show where people were coming from. Um, and this is, this is um, near Oaxaca. These are, these are Mixtec Indians who speak no Spanish. They speak Mixtec. Um, and most of the men in this village were uh, in the north working. In fact, uh, it took us five and a half hours on dirt roads to get to this village. And we drive in and here are these women. And there's this one woman wearing a Dodgers shirt. And it's like, what? Oh yeah, she says, my husband works in Los Angeles. He's undocumented, he works in Los Angeles. So I photographed um, in Mexico, again, with a second National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship to continue photographing and help support that project. This is in Oaxaca, in Tequistepec, a village I lived in for a month and traveled around Oaxaca to photograph feet of the Campesino. And then um, the second part of the book ended up being the border. And this was what the border fence looked like uh, in this era. And this is going from Mexico into um, California. Um, these are people discovered hiding in the trunk of a car. And then the third part would have been the North. Um, as that book was coming out, um, I began to think of what I might do next. And I became very, very interested in, at that time, apartheid in South Africa, uh, which, was, which was horrible. And I felt, at least in America, not very well seen. And I thought about, I should go to South Africa and photograph apartheid. Um, and at, at that time, I had a black colleague, a black journalist colleague, who I was in conversation with. And she kept saying, why go to South Africa? Why don't you go to Mississippi? And I'm like, what do you mean go to Mississippi? This is 1989. Um, and she says, yeah, it's still, it's like apartheid, you should go. And she was so um, adamant and firm about, you know, this is something that I needed to do that I said, okay, I'm gonna go check it out. So I went to Mississippi and this became a four and a half year project um, called Delta Time, which is Peter said, with, an, with a powerful introduction by Bob Moses, who is one of the very important civil rights organizers uh, of Mississippi Summer and the Algebra Project, who just died, uh, I wanna say three days ago. Uh, and there was a front page obituary in the front page of the New York Times uh, about his life and, and the work that he did. Um, and so over four and a half years, and I'm going back and forth, uh, I began to photograph the Mississippi Delta, uh, looking at the lives of people uh, in the Delta working in the cotton fields, uh, which was all at that point mechanized, people living in uh, shacks with no electricity or no running water, um, the culture, the juke joints. Uh, this is in Clarksdale, Mississippi, uh, one, of the, one of the many places people went to listen to blues music and dance and, and drink, um, river baptism, um, I worked deeply in the community, uh, connected with people who were, who were basically guides, who would introduce me to people and uh, vouch for the work that I was doing and the importance of telling the story of this community. And this, this book was uh, published by the Smithsonian. Uh, it came out in uh, 1994. Um, as I was working on the publication of that book, I got a call from a friend who said, um, you know, I live in Texas, Texas is horrible. Um, you know, I wanna do a book. Would you be interested in photographing on Texas death row and doing a book with me? And I said, sure. Knowing that it was virtually gonna be impossible to get, on to get into the prison. It's, it's even to this day, I mean, even then, and even more now, uh, it's just very difficult to get into a prison to photograph other than a walkthrough. They might let you in for two hours and that's really not my process. My process is, is long form. I spend weeks and months and years working on a project, going back and forth and trying to understand it and getting an insight and working with people in, in the communities that I'm photographing. And I said, yes, uh, I'll do it. And knowing it would never happen. But my colleague, Suzanne Donovan, who was the one who gained permission, uh, opened, somehow opened the doors and I spent uh, three weeks over a year uh, inside Texas death row 
photographing with unlimited access, moving in and out of inmates' cells, um, photographing them, telling their stories. Um, and last year I checked and about 75 of the men that I photographed had been executed. Um, and so strip search. This is Richard Beavers as he's being led to be executed. It was a very, very intense story. Uh, it was, uh, I was the only photographer at that point to ever be allowed into a death row to photograph. And there was a massive distribution of the photographs. So Newsweek ran six pages, Parry Match ran eight pages. The photographs appeared all over the world. Um, and then, the, and then uh, that, that was in 1995. And then in late 1996, the book came out, uh, Texas Death Row, University of, of Texas Press. Um, it was really, that book was really um, very intense. Uh, uh, a lot of the men I met, I mean, they, you know, many of them did horrific crimes, um, which I knew going in, but it was about who these men were and why are they on death row and what is their story? And this is a place that was completely hidden. Um, and coming out of that, um, I was really shook up by my experience. I mean, literally, there were days when I would wake up in the morning and pick up a newspaper and one of the inmates I had met who I'd come to know and hear their story had been executed. Um, and so I was teaching at that time as I still am at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Um, and I realized that there wasn't really a book that I liked to have my students read. And I decided in this time when I wasn't really, you know, I had just done this project. I wasn't really sure where I was going as a photographer. I was really, uh, um, I don't know if I had post-traumatic stress, but I was really stressed out from the experience of, of the work and the work had been really reached out to a huge audience. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do next. So I was fortunate enough to get a grant from the Hasselblad Foundation uh, to write this book called Witness, Witness in Our Time, Working Lives of Documentary Photographers, which um, has interviews, narrative interviews, uh, with 26 photographers, Sebastio Salgado, uh, Graciela Interbead, Mary Ellen Mark, uh, Donna Ferrato, Fuzzle Sheik, um, Bill Owens, I mean, a whole, Don McCullen, a whole array of photographers talking about their practice. Um, as the book was coming out, uh, Clinton was president and welfare was beginning to end. And I thought, where, where are people gonna be impacted socially in America? And where is a story that we keep going back to um, when we think about cha economic changes? Um, and so I decided to go and photograph in West, rural West Virginia. Um, and I ended up doing this book called Cole Hollow, which was published by UC Press with oral histories by my, my wife, Melanie. Um, and again, it was a about a four and a half year project photographing throughout rural West Virginia, uh, looking at the culture, the life, the clan was active, um, who are the people, what is their world about? Again, working in the community, connecting with people, having them introduce me, having them uh, giving me access to the many people I photographed. Um, my wife, who, who I was working with at that time who was writing, was asked to do a story about the photographer Hansel Meath, who was one of the early Life Magazine photographers, a second woman photographer hired at Life Magazine after Margaret Burke White. And there was a story about Hansel that had been, uh, Hansel had passed away um, and the Museum of Photographic Arts in San Diego was doing a show in which they included Hansel's work. Um, I, I had become friends with Hansel later in her life um, and my wife had met her and we had spent time with her. Um, and they asked if she would write about Hansel. And my wife went down into the Central Valley where Hansel had, did a lot, had done a lot of work to do some research. And when she came back, she said, my God, the Central Valley's crazy. There's a drought, the housing, the housing prices are crazy. People who are farm workers are getting loans with no interest to buy houses. Um, you need to really go and check it out. Uh, this was before the downturn. And of course, we know that the part of the downturn came from the Central Valley and all these homes that were foreclosed because people actually didn't have the money to buy the homes. 
Um, and we ended up doing this book called Valleys of Shadows and Dreams with a forward by Thomas Steinbeck, who was the son, who was a photographer, but also the son of John Steinbeck, um, who wrote Grapes of Wrath. Uh, and again, it was a four and a half year project photographing in the Central Valley, working in the community, getting out into the fields, photographing industrial agriculture, looking at food lines that all of a sudden appeared, looking at the issues of the drought that was happening uh, and what the world of the Central Valley was about. And this, this book was um, published by Heyday, uh, which is a publisher here in the Bay Area that publishes books about California. Um, following that book um, and, and working on a show with my wife, we got asked by uh, Random House if we would do a book called Picturing Resistance. Uh, and this was before George Floyd and before all the protests that came out around George Floyd. Uh, uh, Trump, Donald Trump was president. There were a lot of protests, not the massive ones that we know that came after the uh, murder of, of George Floyd, but they were very interested in uh, us putting together a book called Picturing Resistance, looking at social change photography uh, from 1950 to today. So the two of us worked together um, editing photographs, um, this is a Robert Alderman photograph, amazing photograph taken in Louisiana. We looked at all different types of picture, political resistance by um, some 80 photographers um, telling this story, Mark Rabu, Pentagon March. Uh, this is a great photograph. Uh, this is the Boston Marathon. This is a, a press photographer uh, for the Boston Globe. Uh, women were not allowed to run in the Boston Marathon at this time. Um, and this woman, as you can see, uh, got a number, uh, didn't use her, her first name uh, as a woman, initial, uh, and began to run. And when the, when the director of the marathon realized that a woman was running, women weren't allowed, here he is trying to push her out of the race. Um, so the range of photographs, um, you know, you can see the gamut. These are all taken by different photographers. Um, when, when Trump was elected, um, I realized his horrible comments about immigration um, and um, Mexicans in general um, made me realize that the work that I had done in the 80s that were into the promised land that there was a lot of work that wasn't included in the book. And I didn't really know going back, you know, 30 years, what I would find. But I decided to go back into my archive and look at the work that I had done, in particular, the work that I had done when I traveled with the Border Patrol, which is very difficult to do now. I had unlimited access with the Border Patrol for weeks on end. I would go out from four in the afternoon until seven in the morning. Uh, photographing with them, sitting with them in their trucks. Now you go out with a public information officer and they really don't let you see things and they, you know, hide things. But in this era, I just went out with an agent as he patrolled along the border. Um, shooting with a Hasselblad, again, handheld Hasselblad with a Vivitar 285. Um, and I began to realize that there were all these photographs that I had never published. And so I began to do a massive edit and then this ended up being a book with TBW, who's an amazing book publisher here in the Bay Area uh, that became Midnight La Frontera, which was a book that came out last year. Beautifully done, incredibly powerful. Um, I'm just gonna show you some of the page spreads. Um, it was, the project ended up having 87 photographs in the overall project. The book has 69 and then Clement Chereau who was then the curator of photography at the SF MoMA. Uh, now he is the curator of photography at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. But at that time he was at the MoMA, uh, bought all 87 photographs for the museum's collection, which was really, really exciting. Um, and so the book is, as I said, is really very, very powerful. Um, it has a incredibly beautiful, powerful uh, essay by Jose Angel Navas called The Jaguar's Path, which is published in the book in English and Spanish, which is his first person account of his journey from Guadalajara through the border and his experiences of being apprehended and what that life is about. 
I mean, it is one of the most beautiful, powerful written pieces that I've ever read firsthand account of uh, an undocumented person coming uh, from Mexico into the US. Um, and this is Jose, who's still undocumented. He lives in Chicago. Um, and he says the stretch between Tijuana and San Diego is long, very long, and it is treacherous, as treacherous as it's beautiful. It is unlikely that anybody who has ever crossed it will easily forget it. It's desert-like landscape is bound to carve itself equally into body and soul. And so um, the book goes from the black into the um, duotone photographs. And it just gives you a sense of uh, many of the photographs that at the time were never, were never published. This is the back of the book. And these are just a few of the single images that I took. A really heart-wrenching story. Um, and we know that the issue of immigration has not ended. It's, it's one of those stories that just keeps, um, I don't know, never ending. This is the last picture in the book. I had already started on a massive project for me, um, which was, a, I started 11 years ago now, I guess it would be 12 years now. Um, I began to realize looking around me that America was falling apart, that income inequality had, had just exploded, that the difference between the haves and the have nots were, was, you, you just couldn't believe it. There were all of a sudden were billionaires and millionaires and there were, you know, this horrible, you know, um, number of millionaires in the Bay Area from dot-com companies. And you're talking about people who are 23 or 24 years old who are now millionaires because they had stock options in these companies. And, you know, they're, they're unconcerned, they're libertarians, they're unconcerned with the world around them. Um, and so I realized that um, I, I needed to, um, I needed to travel around America and I needed to visually describe what I was feeling. And that was the American empire is falling apart, that the middle class is eroding, that the struggle people are feeling is real. It's unseen. It's, it's the, the, uh, the newspapers and TV, they throw out figures of, income inequality. It doesn't really mean anything unless you see it. And you know, those of you in Los Angeles, you can go downtown and you can see the 10 cities. We have the same thing in, in the Bay Area. It's, it's horrible how people are living and it's just all over America. And so I began to photograph and travel all over the United States, um, trying to visually describe um, what I was seeing and what I was feeling. Um, and um, and this is from the book, uh, we must make our choice. We may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis. Um, so I began to photograph and I um, photographed for um, this project seemed to end with Trump's nomination in Cleveland. So I went, I was credentialed. I went to the Republican convention. I photographed at the Republican convention. And I thought the project had ended. Um, and Gerhard Steidel, uh, the German publisher, uh, really liked the work and said, let's do the book. And I said, okay. And I had a maquette of the book, but it took him so long. He's very slow. Uh, he says to a lot of people, I'm going to do your book, but it's a very slow process. And it was so slow. I kept on photographing. And so I kept photographing with the same premise and the same idea. Um, and I ended up um, having four more years of photographs. So all of a sudden I had 11 years of photographs um, that I put together. It was a massive number of pictures, a massive number. I'm shooting film. 
medium, still medium format. I'm printing in the dark room. I'm scanning the negatives. Um, and it was a massive job of figuring out how to tell a story, how to put the pictures together. And I was actually very lucky that um, I was very friendly with Sandra Phillips, who was then curator of photography at the moment in San Francisco and Erin O'Toole, also a curator there. And I went to show them the maquette and they're like, okay, this doesn't work. You need to take it apart and think about it in a different way. And I ended up re-editing all the work um, and putting together this book of photographs that became Course of the Empire, which is 209 photographs divided into 10 different chapters. Um, so chapter one is called Topography of a Nation, and it kind of is photographs across America that I hope visually set you up to see the America that I saw that we most often don't see. Metropolis, Illinois, on the road. This is in Harlem. This is a football day at UC Berkeley at a frat house. This is panhandling on Coney Island, Century City. Chapter two looks at capital and looks at wealth. Wealth. This is a $10,000 a plate uh, opera opening dinner in San Francisco. This is in Chicago. It's the opening of the opera. This is the auctioning of the Scream, which sold for $140 million. It's Sotheby's. And this is just to give you an idea of, again, a page spread. So I'm just showing you a few of the photographs from each chapter. This is the International Polo Club in Florida. Chapter three is the heartland. So it looks at rural America. It's the mayor. It's in Kansas. July 4th parade. It's in Butte, Montana. Again, the page spread. This is Illinois County Fair. This is Arkansas, the Arkansas Delta. Chapter four looks at metropolis, the urban city. This is Los Angeles. This is Hollywood and Vine in Los Angeles. This is a protest against police brutality in New York. This is Hollywood and Vine shining the, the, the Hollywood stars. And again, a page spread. This is a murder in Detroit and the emergency room um, waiting the waiting room in the emergency room in um, the county hospital in Oakland. The subway. Homeless encampment in San Francisco. Chapter five is called disruption. This is a, a hobo squat down in Southern California. and Occupy, again, a page spread, surveillance of the Statue of Liberty and the border in, Calexico, in, in El Centro. This is a police arrest during a protest in Oakland. Trump rally in California. This is the Republican National Convention and this is Donald Trump accepting the, the nomination at the Republican convention in Ohio. Chapter six is called transformation. And this is when we move to the election of Donald Trump. 
This is the inauguration in Washington. Again, a page spread. So Women's March. This is the Comey hearings in Washington, DC. This is in San Diego. This is at the White House. Chapter eight is called Divide. And this looks at the divided America that we now inhabit or sort of visit by Donald Trump in Elko, Nevada. This is a women's protest in San Francisco. This is a pro-life march. Again, a page spread. This is an alt-right rally on the left in Sacramento and a MAGA rally in Elko, Nevada on the right. And this is a Black Lives Matter protest in Oakland, California. Chapter nine is called Calamity. And this is a climate change march. This is a wildfire in Coffee Park in Northern California. Again, a page spread. This is the beginning of the pandemic. And on the right is the first COVID testing in Oakland, California. And this is, um, this was a result of the wildfire. This is actually 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, I don't know if you guys had it in, in Los Angeles, but in the Bay Area, we had a day where um, the sky was completely red, the sun was blocked. It looked like nighttime because of the smoke and the ash and those little dots are actually the ash dropping uh, in, in the Bay Area. And this is looking down into San Francisco, which is obliterated by the smoke. Chapter 10 is called Finale. And it looks at the last year of Trump's power and administration. On the left is downtown Oakland, which of course probably like LA and other places was all boarded up and a protest arrest on the right, again, a page spread. It's Lincoln Memorial, in Washington. This is a political presidential rally, candidate rally. And again, a page spread. This is a TV gra grab of Fox News projecting Biden wins and a celebration on the right when it was announced that he had been elected. And then this is inauguration day. And then this is the last, the last photograph in, in the book. So you're just seeing a very sh small number of the photographs. Um, again, this book uh, is just about to come out. Um, it's 209 photographs. Um, it's really, uh, I'm very excited about it. It really is, I think, one of the earliest records of this period that we've all just lived through. Thank God we've lived through it. Um, and it's something that I think people, historians and others are gonna be talking about it for a very, very long time. And to me, that's the power of, of photography. The, the ability to tell stories, um, to witness as a photographer, to go out and, and try to understand the world around you um, and, to, and to make photographs that really express uh, what it is you're think, thinking about. And this is um, the front cover and the back cover of, of the new book. So um, that's kind of a lot of pictures, as I said, um, maybe too many. Um, but I am happy to answer questions. Um, well, Ken, I'm going to start off with a few yeah, sure. questions of my own and a, and a few comments. First of all, phenomenal work and just amazing. Really, I, I just uh, was was blown away. And 
you know, looking, it was interesting your comment about how you look back at your work and, and you see some of the context that you don't see when you photograph it. And, and I understand that, you know, I look back at pictures I took in New York in the 80s and I'm like, it has a historical context, but you were actually photographing history. So I found it kind of an interesting comment that you were still feeling that way, even though you were kind of documenting what I would say is, is kind of one of the more transitional periods in our history. I guess that's just taken from my kind of limited, you know, lens, so to speak. But, you know, I, I was also struck by the last book and, you know, there's, there was a style difference and, and something that I noticed, I mean, it was the framing, the, the use of juxtaposition that it was just really elevated in terms of the, the, the storytelling and the images themselves. So I don't want to say the, the previous work wasn't artful, but there was something just extremely artful about the, the, the last book you did. And I was just so impressed. Um, I had a few questions. I wrote them out before kind of had a chance to see. So I'll just kind of ask them and then we'll, we'll kind of yeah. see where it goes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always interested in the way photographers work. And, uh, you know, looking through, you know, some of your projects, they were all very location oriented. This, this last project was literally the whole country. And so I was, you know, how did you choose your locations? And I'm sure you, you probably had a huge network of people to assist you. But I was also struck by the access you got, you know, between Trump rallies and high end, you know, balls and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about like what goes into a project like this in terms of preparation? I don't think people sometimes understand how much the, the, the end result is, 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 the, is the result of, of the, the work, the, the footwork you do ahead of time. Yeah, well, some things were um, on my radar. You know, I'd see, I might see an article in a newspaper, or I'd try to think, you know, how do I show this part of the, the America? And, you know, I think the wealth was the hardest part, you know, because the wealth, I mean, people who, people who are poor, they live their lives very openly and on the street, and you can see it, and you can make a photograph. People who have wealth are very hidden. And I always like to say, um, you know, if you get an assignment from a magazine to photograph someone smoking crack, for example, you go down to the Tenderloin in San Francisco, there's probably as many people smoking crack in Marin County who are lawyers and doctors, but it's not like they're gonna let you in the front door to get a photograph of it. So that, that part was the hardest part. Um, and luckily, you know, for example, the the opening of the opera and the $10,000 plate dinner, normally I wouldn't get access, but one of my colleagues was, or um, was at that point, director of photography at the San Francisco Chronicle. And I called her and I said, hey, I'd really like to go to photograph this and I need to be credentialed. And, you know, can you help me? And she says, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm doing this book and this is what it's about. And it's she says, well, when's the book going to come out? I said, oh, no, it's probably five years away, which kind of gives her a little bit of protection because she probably will be gone in five years. So she's like, OK, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll give I'll get you credentialed as a chronicle photographer. And so I, that's how I got cr credentialed going to Wall Street and photographing at Wall Street. That was a nightmare, a complete nightmare. I mean, they were like, no, no, no. I, I work with uh, Contact Press Images in New York, um, who represents Don McCullen and Salgado and you know all these great photographers. And my agent there, Jeffrey Smith, he he try. I mean, he wrote to them. They said no, you, you we don't let anyone in. And he got the New York Times to write a letter, and they said no. And he got Fortune to write a letter. He said no. They wouldn't let me in. And it's like wow. And finally. Um, I connected with an AP photographer, Associated Press photographer, who's on the floor of the market photographing for the AP. And he says, oh, I know a broker. I know someone who has a seat on the exchange and I'll connect you. And so he actually got me in and I spent two days photographing on the floor of the, of the stock market. Um, other times, it's just literally, um, I have a triple A map, you know, the old fashioned map. And I kind of, people tell me things, someone says, go to Butte, Montana. And, you know, I'm, I, I think the hardest part of traveling across the country 
is if you use Google, Google Maps, which is fantastic, they're going to put you all on the freeway and you're never going to see anything except for the freeway. And they just bypass all these towns. And it's interesting because I just this past April received a Guggenheim Fellowship to do a project on the Rust Belt. And I just came back from three weeks photographing in Michigan and uh, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Um, and it was the same sort of thing. I had some ideas of places I wanted to go. Um, a lot of the research is done in the field. Um, I'm not one of these people who like does extensive research before I hit the road. I just like to hit the road and I just like the photo gods pointing me in the direction. And I just get in my car and I mean, incredibly observant. Um, just the littlest thing. I mean, I could be, I mean, one of my favorite photographs from this trip that I just took was a photograph. I was just driving along on the freeway going to this neck, going to, I think I was going to Toledo and it's raining and I'm just on the freeway looking and all of a sudden I see on the left, this giant Uncle Sam statue. And I'm what the hell? And you know, I get off the next exit, which is 10 miles down the road and figure out how to get there and the, the gates close and I open the gate and I drive in and you know it's a fireworks um giant fireworks building selling fire you know July 4th is over but there's where they sell fireworks and they have this giant Uncle Sam and I noticed behind the, uh, the building is a cornfield and it's muddy and I just trek out into the field and I photograph from the, the back and there's my photograph. The, the photograph, in fact, of, of the, um, the cover of the book of the balloon that says sail with the American flag taken in Los Angeles and literally on the freeway. And I look and it, it, it's a car dealership in Los Angeles. And they have this giant balloon with sail. And I'm like, oh, my God, this just so describes America to me. You know, it's for sale. Everything in America is for sale. And I, and I pull off, you know, I figure out how to get off the freeway, which is not so easy in Los Angeles. Um, you could end up in San Diego. Uh, I, I pull off and, um, you know, I take the side road and go to the car dealership and kind of pull up and get out with my camera. And I just kind of walk into the dealership and I start photographing and the guy comes out and says, what are you doing? And I like, I love this balloon. It's just fantastic. And they're like, okay, they probably think I'm some crazy person, you know, and they just leave me alone. And I make that photograph and it ends up being the cover of the book. I don't know if that, that's a long answer to your question. Oh, that's a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, we talked a little bit about, do, do you ever engage with your subjects? Sometimes, never, often. Yeah, we, we talked about the idea of, of asking permission and, you know, that's how... Yeah. It's not very realistic. And I'm just kind of wondering, like, what's, you know, do you just kind of detach from your, your subjects? I imagine it, it must be difficult in some situations, but can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I do, I do both. Um, sometimes I, I do a lot, I guess I would call it street shooting. I mean, I just encounter something, it's very quick. It's like the last picture of in the book, which is the free, the guy, the black, young black man with the freedom on the back of his jacket. I mean, that was in Detroit and I'm walking down the street and all of a sudden, boom, there he is. And, you know, I take a really quick photograph of him. And I mean, I probably got two or three frames off and he's, he's gone. Um, other times there are conversations. Um, sometimes I get model releases signed, sometimes I don't. It really depends on the situation. Generally, I don't. Um, yeah, it depends. It depends on the situation. And, you know, uh, one of the photographs I didn't show was a photograph I took in Arkansas when a prostitute picked me up downtown in a small rural town in Arkansas in the Arkansas Delta. And, um, you know, I went to her place to make photographs of her. Um, and, you know, in that case, I would get a I would get a release signed and I would explain what I was doing. And she asked me for a print. I sent her a photograph. So it's it's a mix. Yeah. But, you know, I, I strongly believe that you should be able to make photographs in public places. And I know that's not very popular with younger photographers now, but. I think of all the pictures that um, we've got. Yeah, taken. I'm an older photographer, so I think, you know. 
Um, I have one more question, then we'll go to, to everyone else. Just in terms of the editing process, um, yeah. I recently was kind of rereading The Americans uh, by Frank, and he, he took, God knows, thousands and thousands of photos. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, and I'm just wondering, over 10 years, how many photos did you accrue, and what was your editing process, uh, especially since it kind of changed, you know, and got added another four years? Yeah. So I'm shooting 120 film so it's 12 exposures on a roll so i'm you know i do the old-fashioned thing i make contact actually make contact sheets and i kept them kind of organized by um you know places and and i mean when i go out and shoot i have um manila envelopes and as i'm shooting i write field notes on the envelopes and i throw the film into the bag uh so i when i get back with you know, whatever. I mean, I just came back from this trip I just described with 200 rolls of film um, that I had shot. And, and you know, it's hard to, when you come back, it's hard to know the difference of Toledo and Flint, Michigan. A lot of the, I mean, there's a lot of similarities. And so keeping track of that is, is really, really important. Um, and then, you know, I go through the contact sheets. I mark those pictures that right away hit me as being, I really like this picture. And then I have always described it as a puzzle, putting together a book and a project. And you always go to the outer edge of, the, you know, you learn as a young kid to make a puzzle. You find the, you know, the edge to put the frame and then you put the more difficult pieces to complete the puzzle. And I find with my own work, it's the same way. I, you know, a lot of the pictures I first pull out are really obvious. And then it's a matter of really looking deeply and particularly on course of the empire, you know, what is my story and what pieces fit in and 209 pictures in a book is a lot of photographs in a book. And luckily, Steidel is, you know, a completely eccentric publisher, you know, uh, and if you have not, if you have not seen if you have Netflix, you should watch Steidelville. It's a documentary on Gerhard Steidel. And it's, he's amazing. I mean, someone said, do you have a contract? No, it's just a handshake. What do you mean it's a handshake? Yeah, he puts his hand out, he shakes your hand and says, I'm gonna do your book. And that's it, nothing in writing. And, you know, um, I sent a maquette to them of the, of the layout with the white pages and the order and the chapters and they followed the maquette, never a question like, Ken, you have too many pictures or we don't like this picture. Um, and so the, the editing process was, um, how do the pictures fit together? Um, as I said, the idea of having chapters worked because there were so many pictures and I felt like the pictures were just gonna run on and maybe the story wasn't gonna be clear. and the chapters for me really set the tone of what I was trying to de describe very, very clearly. So, um, well, I'm going to go to a few questions here. Uh, yeah. First of all, Debbie Harlick says, wow, Ken, you are the Robert Frank of the 21st century, apropos. Um, Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> uh, Chrysia uh, asks, when did you photograph the high school series? Did you find that getting permission to photograph in places like that more difficult today? And how would you suggest approaching places for this kind of permission? Yeah, so I photographed the high school students in 19, uh, let's see, um, 1971. And, um, and, it was, and it was actually probably the biggest mistake of my career, not doing the project. But um, I did, I got permission, I photographed, um, you know, I graduated from high school in 1969. So I was kind of like, I was virtually a high school student still. Um, and partly was that project was trying to understand what high school was about and what that experience was about. Um, and I probably went to about 15 different high schools and, uh, People were, you know, there's no, there was no Facebook and no Instagram and no computers and photographs were just photographs and people just didn't have the concerns that they have now. You know, now people want to curate their own lives, right? I've been at demonstrations where people say, you can't take my picture. 
I'm like, you're in a public place. Well, you know, you can't take my picture. And they hold up a sign and they block, they block you. And then five minutes later, you see them with their friend posing with the sign, taking a selfie because they're, they're, they're curating their own world. And, and they don't want you to curate their world. And they don't understand the importance of photography and history. Um, so it's much, it's much harder now to get permission. And I think you have to really think, um, how do I spin my project in a way that people feel comfortable? Even though maybe your intention is different than what you're spinning. So I remember when I did the, ag the work in the agricultural workers, for example, I was really fascinated with child labor. I thought it was really important to document, but you can't just walk onto a field and take pictures because it's private property. You have to get permission. Um, and you know, I couldn't go up to the owner of the field and say, hey, I'm here to document child labor because I would probably be run out of town. And so I would say, um, I'm here to do a story about the harvest and the importance of the harvest and what it's like, you know, for a farmer and blah, 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 blah. And I would always figure out a time to go like the height of the harvest. So, you know, when the farmer was kind of overwhelmed with bringing the crops in and here I am and they're not gonna really think too deeply about what I'm doing. And then I would get permission and I'd go in and I would be very careful of how I photographed. I wouldn't immediately start photographing children because people would then become very suspicious who is this guy? Maybe he's from the INS, you know, immigration, and because it was all undocumented people. So it's, you know, really figuring out what you're doing. And then people say, well, where are the pictures going to go? So you have to have an answer for that as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, please put it in the chat. Um, I have uh, one, you know, I, you, you photograph some really intense situations. Um, and I was reminded there's a picture by Mar Margaret Bork White of the camps being liberated. I don't know if it's- out Yeah, there. of course. And, and I always think, you know, we look at that and it, the horror of it, but I, from the photographer's perspective, you're walking into a situation and, and you're experiencing it with like four or five senses, the smells, the sounds, you know, there's, it's an emotional experience. And as a photographer, you're still called to duty to do your job. And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, has there been any project or series or location where I think you found that maybe more difficult than you might normally to, to detach or, or have you kind of developed uh, the, the, the skills or I don't know if you'd call it that to, to kind of overcome whatever that initial reaction might be? Yeah, well, there, you know, there's many times when you're out when you're really sad and you, and you I mean, this recent trick I took you know, on the Rust Belt, it's just, just sad to witness. I mean, to see the devastation of these communities in which, you know, you once had an auto factory that employed 80,000 people. And one day they say, we're closing down the factory and that's the end. And, you know, people's, the whole town almost disappears. And um, I mean, it's just crazy to see what's, what's going on in these communities um, and, and very sad, but I think partly it's the drive to tell the story and to, and to witness it. And I really feel um, the importance of witnessing because I mean, you know, uh, you talked about Burke White's photograph and I'm sure that moment really impacted her tremendously seeing that. And for me, it was probably the death row project, you know, knowing these men were gonna be executed um, and kind of knowing they did horrific crimes, but also knowing their, their backstories of who they were and what happened and why they got there. Um, but you think of that picture and the historical importance, and if Margaret Burke White hadn't made that picture, there probably would be more people saying, oh, it never happened. Right. And that's part of, I think, the drive to do the course of the empire, that we're in denial as Americans. We're totally in denial of what's happening around us, even though we see it. And so many people avoid it, you know? Um, and I know, you know, in LA, downtown LA, you know, is horrific with the tense cities and the homeless people as it is in San Francisco. But, you know, someone from Brentwood is not gonna drive downtown to, to look at that. And the media doesn't really cover it because 
It doesn't sell newspapers. It's not good television. Um, and so it doesn't really impact a lot of people. I was really struck by the, the photos of the, uh, the immigrants and, you know, the night shots with the flash on camera, almost kind of like stark Ouija type of photo. And, you know, yeah. that's a, I've never seen pictures like that. You know, you see immigrants being kind of arrested and so forth, but, you know, here they were in their hiding places. I mean, yeah, you were. just kind of like walk with the, the agency and just kind of get that shot off before anything could happen. And I've never seen photos like that. And it was, that to me is kind of what I was thinking of these people that it's like their life is about to change and it's heartbreaking yeah. yeah it was hard it was it was very it was heartbreaking but it always felt like it was a really incredible and important yeah. document to have because we don't we don't see that right. we don't see that moment and um you know i thought a lot when i was doing that of lewis hines photographs of immigrants coming through ellis island you know, and the experience that people who were all of a sudden arriving from Eastern Europe with their one suitcase and they didn't speak the language and they were being asked all types of questions and, you know, um, how important it is to record our history. And it was an opportunity when I realized they just let me do this stuff, you know, um, there were a lot of, there were a lot of journalists during that era photographing along the border, but you know, the technology, it wasn't so much fun to photograph at night. The technology wasn't like it is today, you know. Um, and so they would mainly photograph at sunset and they get their picture and that would be the end of it. And, you know, newspapers didn't say, okay, go spend weeks doing this. You know, you got your picture and that was it. And, you know, I've, I've always felt like you really need to dive into a story to understand it, to really witness it and see it. And that opens up a lot of opportunities as you're doing that. You learn a lot, people tell you stories, um, you, you become more observant. Well, that was evident. Um, Chrisia, uh, Chrisia, sorry if I'm mispronouncing, was the image of Coffee Park from Santa Rosa? Yes, it was. Yeah, I'm doing a whole kind of another project, side project, I don't know if it's a side project, it's just there, of, photographing the aftermath of wildfires. So I'm not, I'm not a wildfire photographer. I mean, I don't go to the fire when the fire's happening. I go after the fire's over. Um, and with a press credential, they let you through the police lines and you can just roam around and photograph the aftermath. And it's really horrific, but fascinating. You know, the remnants of, of the wildfires. So I've been doing that kind of, um, Coffee Park was in Santa Rosa was the first fire that I did. And I have done many, you know, I was up in paradise a number of times photographing in paradise, which would have been probably, you know, two or three days after they, you know, the fire swept through and before people actually are, are coming in. Yeah. Yeah. She said that was my brother's neighborhood that burnt down right before. Yeah. Oh my God. It was so sad. Really, really, was, really sad. I photographed a lot of, post wildfire and the silence, the deadening yeah. deadly silence is the thing yeah. that's broken. Anybody have any other questions? Peter, I think there, uh, Debbie uh, had a question about yeah. the Guggenheim Fellow uh, that um, <coughs> can apply Did for. Did you have a question? I'm sorry. Oh, how that's many? That's okay. Yeah. Go ahead and ask yeah, it. I was, uh, thanks, I can. I'm so happy to see you speak and I'm so sorry I came in a little late. So I'm hoping that I get to see recording and hi, Peter. Everybody. Um, yeah, congratulations on getting the Guggenheim. That's fantastic. I know that's a great feather for you. And of course, the NEA, it's just wonderful and a great nod. And I'm curious to know, because so many great photographers, it took them like 10 times sometimes to oh, yeah. get to. So what was your process 15, like? 15 times. <gasps> what? Which is, not, which is not so unusual, as you said. Um, I heard the story the other day of a photographer who applied 25 times. And got it or didn't get <laughs> got it? Got it. No, <laughs> it did it on the 25th time. <laughs> <laughs> so are you showing the same work? Like how do you, how do you then, you know, present the work? What are you doing each time? You know, um, it changed. I mean, I go back, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in keeping artifacts you know, which is important when, you know, as a photographer, you keep all that stuff. Uh, 
because it's part of your, your archive. And it was interesting, I kind of went back and looked at all the rejection letters I had <laughs> and even the project proposals, um, which, you know, were all, which, which have all become books, right? I mean, these are all different projects I applied for that, you know, the Delta book and early work and blah, 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 blah. And um, it's, it's all mysterious, Debbie. I wish I could give you an answer. It's all mysterious. <laughs> Um, I expected to get rejected again. It's kind of like, oh, should I apply again? It's, you know, I have pretty tough skin. So it's kind of like I'm depressed for about, you know, two hours. And then it's like, okay, whatever. It's like not going to stop me from doing what I'm doing. It would be nice for it to happen. Um, but it, it's not going to stop me. Um, and so, yeah, I just, um, I think I worked more intently on the proposal and I actually had a friend who kind of looked at the proposal and talked to me about it and, you know, worked on, gave me, gave me a lot of ideas how to present the proposal. And it might have just been the time, you know, times change and people's attitudes change. And part of my proposal was about, you know, the Rust Belt of the swing states and why did people vote for Donald Trump? They were once Democrats and what is it about these, these communities that have shifted people's politics? And I wanna show what that world is about. So it might've partly been the time. It could be the person who is looking at the work, the, the committee that looks at the work and decides and that may have shifted. Um, and so yeah. you, you've finished that project now though, and then you just, then you have now this fellowship and the money. So how, what happens? No, I just that? started it. This is my first, what? I just started it. Oh, for, this isn't from the, what the book part, this is, okay, no, no, this I misunderstood. Is no, this is a new project at the Rust Belt. Yeah, so it's a it. whole new project. Well, the, the book is stunning. And I mean, it really, it's like hit me as the Americans as of today. Thank and, you. and really phenomenal, um, just pretty breathtaking. And, and it's fascinating, you know, we as photographers and here you are, you know, living, we're living history and you're documenting. It's like, okay, do you ever think to yourself, you know, we're talking about Margaret Bork White and, and you know, Lewis Hine. When you're seeing these things, do you think you're photographing today as it will be seen as his, historical? Like what goes through your mind? Yeah, I think a lot about history. And I, as I said, I think a lot about witness and, you know, what are those, what are those moments that um, I can make a poignant photograph and of course you're thinking about light and exposure and composition and framing and you know all those kind of things that make a photograph really interesting and it was it was really interesting um there was one of the first reviews was someone on amazon who uh, i think i can't remember something like goodreads or some sort of that kind of organization and they wrote a very extensive review of the book, which was kind of really interesting. Um, and partly because they called out certain photographs. I mean, they obviously knew a lot about photography, like, oh, there's this photograph of this couple in the Central Valley and they're along the road and they're pulling a wagon. And it's just like Dorothy and Lang's photograph in 1929. And then there's this photograph on this page, which has the same caption as Robert Frank's photograph in Butte, Montana, looking out the window. And it's like, yeah, well, that's actually the same window that Robert Frank photographed out of. I went there. Someone said, when you're in Butte, you need to go to the hotel where Robert Frank stayed. And I'm like, oh, OK. Um, and you know, another picture that reminded them of this. And so you know, history repeats itself. And I think visual images, partly um, you want to make images that, that recall um, other photographers work and that we're all indebted, I am indebted to all these photographers that came before me and what they saw and how they saw it. And not that I'm going it's out to copy it, but- Right, and you're making moments. yesterday, today, it's almost like time yeah. hasn't changed, right? Time has not changed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Can you uh, tell us again when the book is going to be available and where it's going to be available? Yeah, you can get the book on Amazon right now. 
so it is available. I think that I think the actual release date is September, but um, a couple uh, last weekend, last Sunday, um, the Washington Post ran a two-page double truck spread in their insight section about about the book um, about with the photographs, which was really really great. Um, and that was actually the first first kind of publicity about the book. But the books the books around. Uh, we have, we're just starting the whole PR review thing. Um, but yeah, you well, can order it on Amazon. I think they sold out, but that, I mean, there's lots of books. Someone just said it's out of stock, but. Uh, yeah, but you can order it. Okay. Well. Get on the waiting list. <laughs> congratulations and good luck with it and with your Thank new you. project. Um, and uh, Brandon, um, turn it back to you to close up here. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, Peter, thank you as well uh, for your time tonight and moderating. I really appreciate that. Um, and for all the attendees for coming here. And I nice see you, Debbie, uh, Christia, some familiar faces up there. Ken, that was amazing. A truly incredible presentation. Um, very inspiring. Uh, well done. Uh, it's been a treat having you here and uh, look forward to having you back some other time. Uh, thank you for having me. Good meeting you all get out there and make photographs. I always tell my students, the hardest part of being a photographer is getting out the front door. <laughs> That's the truth. Perfect, perfect way to close it out. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone.